I am honored to be able to introduce Stephen Houston as our distinguished speaker this year for the Charlotte Memorial Lecture. In late 1992 and early 1993, we became aware of an opportunity to recruit a promising young scholar from Vanderbilt University. We, with the help of John Clark, who brought uh, him to my attention, I was chair, and with the immediate reactions of Clean Pope, we were able to clear through the, uh, what should I say, underbrush of BYU bureaucracy on hiring and uh, make progress on a, uh, a hire for the Houstons, for Stephen Houston. By 1994, September 94, he joined us on our faculty and for 10 years has had, was and still is a crucial, uh, well, the still is, I guess, is for 10 years he was on our faculty officially and he still is collaborating with faculty members now to this day. That's what I meant to say. So he still is with us, though he is now a professor at Brown University. During his time with us, he was, has been involved in and one of three or four of the most prominent members of the group of scholars involved in the modern continued decipherment of Mayan hieroglyphics. But in addition to being a scholar of hieroglyphics, uh, or of Mayan glyphs, glyphics I suppose is the better word to use, he has been a significant archaeologist in all of the other facets of, of archaeology. And by bringing together both uh, archaeology in the sense of being able to dig for new data and the decipherment process, with regard to Mayan glyphs, he has brought us a cultural picture uh, and enriched a cultural picture that has become extraordinary for a people that is now past. While he is with us, while he was with us, he proceeded to publish a number of distinguished articles. A number of these articles were in collaboration with other scholars. He impacted the career of these other scholars, including several here at Brigham Young University and elsewhere. He gave um, ideas away that others could work on and then possibly collaborate with them and possibly receive nothing but perhaps a line of credit in someone else's uh, um, references. He has been singularly uh, generous in his intellectual uh, participation at this university and elsewhere. In 2004, he departed Brigham Young University for Brown University where he could work in a PhD program and has been successful there and is now in a named professorship, the Dupuy Family Professorship in the Social Sciences, if I caught that correctly by memory. In 2008, he was awarded the MacArthur Fellowship. Now, the MacArthur Fellowship is an extraordinary award. It is given, there are relatively few of them, given in all fields, and it is the only really large and, and super prestigious award available in the social sciences outside of the Nobel Prize for Economics, which is kind of fenced in to that one discipline. Well, I know there are other awards, but in the rest of the disciplines besides economics, that is the most prestigious that I know of in the social sciences. Now, quite apart from these intellectual accomplishments and having published a storm, which included, while he was here at Brigham Young University, for example, 7.4 uh, referee journal articles and book chapters per year during his 10 years with us, which is quite remarkable, especially if you compare it with me. Um, <laughs> quite apart from this intellectual production, Steve Houston is and has been a graceful and gracious human being. 
and he loves to ski Black Diamond, Utah. He has almost broken my leg several times. Um, having said all of this, it is also important to note that much of this credit needs to go to Nancy, his spouse who is here with him, who in many ways kept the financial reality of the household down to earth, and in other ways made it possible for Steve Houston to be the extraordinary scholar that he became and is now. So with these thoughts on Steve's humanity and Nancy's graciousness and their mutual contribution to this intellectual endeavor, I give you Dr. Steve Houston. As we've commented to many of you during these short, very brief days here, far too few days really, uh, this really very much feels like coming home and we've been uh, overjoyed by the warm reception from many of you and uh, couldn't be happier to be among you this afternoon. Now, of course, in so far as we are traveling down memory lane, I have decided in this afternoon to address the whole concept of memory because I have so many fond, uh, very affectionate, even loving memories of BYU and of many in this audience. And I have to say, I, uh, of course, I, I give my full thanks to the Department of Anthropology for inviting me to the college for sponsoring this, for Abby Foresight in particular, for all of her help in arranging logistics. Uh, it reminds me once again of, of what a special place Brigham Young University is. My talk is going to begin with a series of, to me, surprising testimonies about the nature of graphic notations uh, in, in, in this case, uh, an unusual setting. This setting is one that temporarily lies astride the reigns of two very important figures in British history. The second one being probably more important than this uh, rather uh, portly gentleman who is King Billy, the sailor king of the United Kingdom, who ruled between 1830 and 37. This is, of course, right at the time in which England is beginning to embark on its period of industrial expansion. This is the fluorescence, uh, the coalescence of the modern nation state as we know it. King Billy, the sailor king, was replaced by a young woman who was uh, less portly at this time, although that was soon to change in her own life, by the young Queen Victoria. So in other words, this is um, an historical setting that is well known to many of you. It is the setting in many ways of the, of the modern world as we have come to know it. Now, in that time, this building, particularly during the, the, just prior to the reign of Queen Victoria, this extraordinary structure was constructed in Westminster. It is, of course, the houses of the uh, Parliament, including the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And we could see over to the side the iconic image of Big Ben, uh, shown here in somewhat lurid light at night. What is uh, perhaps less known is the complex history by which this structure came into existence. And for this, I will turn to a third figure, not uh, King William IV, nor to Queen Victoria, but to Augustus Welby Northmer Pugin, who lived for a rather short span, but during his time was able to enact dramatic changes in the history of modern taste. He has also supplied below, since he was a great enthusiast of Gothic architecture, his view of a first-rate wife who is a woman who understands and delights, inspires chancels, screens, stained glass, brasses, vestments, etc. And I'm happy to report that Nancy has not had to uh, be inflicted with all of my strange idiosyncratic interests. <laughs> Something occurred that has involved Queen Victoria, King William, and also Pugin. And this took place on the night of the 16th of October in 1834. And here you can see that singular event taking place. It is a conflagration that is consuming the Houses of Parliament as it was then known, a Byzantine labyrinth of medieval structures, um, some of great beauty, but generally speaking, it was not necessarily a very coherent architectural ensemble. On that night, probably the greatest colorist ever to appear in modern art, uh, early modern art as well, Joseph Milord Turner was beckoned by the ferocious and fierce lights on the horizon, and he came to, with his sketchbook to record the Houses of Parliament going up in smoke. And at this time, we have 
thanks to this record, which was eventually distilled through his unique creative consciousness, the extraordinary painting that you see in the background, which is his portrait of the burning of those distinguished and uh, august buildings. Now, Pugin was actually quite delighted by this conflagration, and he said, I quote here, there is nothing much to regret and a great deal to rejoice in. And he even describes, in, a, in I think, a rather strangely uh, sadistic uh, fashion, the glorious sight of the mullions, cement pinnacles flying and cracking. Now, there can be no doubt that Pugin, who was a celebrated architect at the so time, saw this as a glorious opportunity in which to begin construction on the Houses of Parliament that we see today and which have been the backdrop to countless movies, including many uh, featuring James Bond. Now, there is another eminent Victorian who will now come into the picture, not so much Pugin, but this gentleman, probably known to us all uh, because of his work, such as The Christmas Carol. This is, of course, Charles Dickens. Now, Dickens is looking down in a glowering fashion at these small wooden objects, which I will explain shortly. This arrow is meant to indicate his distaste for those objects because in a document which comes to us from that time, he uses this as an opportunity to rail against the inefficient bureaucracies of early Victorian England. And he describes particularly a series of worn out, worm-eaten, rotten old bits of wood. And what these were, were small sticks that had notches on them that were apparent and stored in such abundance that in an act when they were burned in a stove in the House of Lords, what eventually happened was the two houses of government were reduced to ashes. And of course, Dickens extends this to a broader critique uh, of the inefficiencies of the early modern state presided over by King William and by Queen Victoria. Now these objects were to me a matter of some astonishment. When I passed through London some years ago, I was still at BYU, I went with my daughter to a small exquisite medieval building called the Treasure House. And in it, we were told that that building had from floor to ceiling literally millions of small wooden sticks which had led to this catastrophic um, collapse of the old and medieval buildings in the Palace of Westminster. One of those objects is up on the top of the screen. This is what is known as a tally stick. It comes from a medieval word in medieval Latin for cutting, for a rod, and for a planting. And it is simply a shaved piece of wood, usually of willow, uh, ash was also employed. And this one in particular is recording, if you can just make out, a reference of a debt owed or coming from the farms of one Fulk Bassett, who was, we know, a Bishop of London who expired in one of the first onslaughts of the black pest and death that passed through Europe. And that is shown right there. This is the burial of many of those uh, early deceased. Now the tally sticks, which led to this surprising event in early modern European history, have contributed many, many terms to our vocabulary. For instance, they had both split and unsplit forms, and from these come not only the word tally, as in, come Mr. Tally Man, count me my bananas, but also the very word for stock exchange, which involves down below such an activity taking place in the modern period, but originally referred to the stocks of wood that would be employed in the tally notations. And down below is one such notation of the split form. You can see that someone has sliced partly through it. It's been divided into two different sections, and these would be held separately by different people. One set, perhaps, might go eventually to the exchequer in England. How were these quantities indicated on the many millions of pieces of split wood that were in the exchequer in the Palace of Westminster? Quantity was indicated by the depth of notch, which you can see in the serrated, somewhat corrugated fashion at the bottom of this particular stick. Let me give you one example of how these tally sticks functioned. And I think all of you should be very correctly and very properly astonished at the late date of this. This is 1739 which means that it's taking place and it was created in the reign of George II, who was, of course, the second Hanoverian king. On this document, you see recorded in a, a calligraphic uh, chancery hand, a loan to that king, King George II, on 3% annuities. This was eventually placed within the Houses of Parliament and was as an important part of the financial reckoning of this early modern state. How was the quantity actually recorded on this tally stick? It was done, as I said before, by means of notches of varying depth. Uh, 
for instance, the quantity of 200 pounds would be indicated, as you can see here, by the yellow arrows pointing to two small notches. The quantity of 30 pounds, as we pass down this place notational system, are also signaled by those three little notches of diminished depth at the bottom of the tally stick. And then finally, since we all know where this is going, I don't necessarily need to go through the entire tally, you can see that six pounds is indicated by yet smaller notches of reduced size down below, and so forth. In other words, we are dealing with an alternative system of graphic notation involving sticks that were an important part of the maintenance of state all the way to up to the time of Queen Victoria. Now these systems of notation we know recorded, were recorded and were constantly employed up into about the time of Queen Victoria's death. They are, for instance, found in abundance in a small vitrine in the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, where, which was the second moment or occasion in which I came into, in, into um, uh, 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 close contact with these strange tallies. And these tallies are, as I said, found in the museum that is a museum. This is uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum, which is organized according to the evolutionary concepts of um, a gentleman who figures very importantly in the history of archaeology. And this is General Augustus Lane Fox Pitt Rivers. To him owes we owe credit for most of the stratigraphic precision that we employ today. He was probably the first careful archaeologist. What is less known about Pitt Rivers is that he was much concerned with human evolution. He was much exercised by the ideas of Herbert Spencer and other social evolutionists of the late 19th century. Many of these ideas are beginning to flourish at a time in which the Victorians begin to see themselves as a uniquely superior form of humanity, and they begin to grade others and their varying accomplishments or lack thereof with respect to the Victorians. And in this museum and a small display of writing, we have a set of tallies. The one at the bottom here, as, as I recall, refers to a tally of sheep, and it was recorded in 1902 when it was collected by one of the first museum anthropologists in our discipline, Henry Balfour. This stick is a notch stick that was clearly used by a shepherd, and he was keeping score there right at the, right at the very final year of Queen Victoria's life of a score of lambs born. White notches were singles, reds were twins, and so forth. And was co collected in Worcestershire, and then very, very soon thereafter, incorporated in the collections of a museum of a museum, which is the Pitt Rivers, shown in this panoramic view at the top. Give you an example of another one of the tallies in this distinguished collection. We can turn to yet another object retrieved by Balfour as he went around the English countryside, beginning to collect artifacts that he s understood, I think, all too well that he understood acutely would soon disappear from the ethnographic landscape of modern England. And here we have a tally stick and a description left by Balfour of how it would have been used. He describes a tally man who came around at intervals during the day when the hops, which go into beer, an important part of beer production, would be measured. And then uh, eventually they would be recorded for each family. At the end of the picking season, these tallies, some split, some not, would be exchanged for cash. So this is an important part of, we might say, the buttress of the rural economy of England up until uh, just a little over 100 years ago. Now having said all that about this very peculiar find and uh, very um, tenacious tradition of non-writing uh, notation in England, I also want to make a broader point about the numbers that would be found in those tallies. And I will basically describe them as ontological, a fancy word that in this case simply refers to the fact that they stand for, in some cases, physically embody or incorporate the things that are being counted by the count, uh, tally. Now, uh, sometimes the tally would be of gold sovereigns, such as the, this one from the reign of uh, King Charles II. They are, in some ways, they stand for the object being tallied, but they also represent an act of legal witness. In other words, they have a, 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 the compulsion of law behind them and would be treated as such in courts up into that time. 
You also saw from what I just showed you that lambs could be counted. This is a, an actual photograph of an English lamb. I made sure that I got the nationality right. And then here you can see a handful of hops, which I'm told are extraordinarily smelly and unpleasant uh, growths, which are collected for beer. Why am I including all of this information, aside from it, uh, distance as a historical idiosyncrasy of England? It's because I see it, and I found, saw it at the time when I first witnessed the presence of these tallies as part of a counterintuitive reality of what England would have been like at the time. We have this Victorian, Dickensian world of squalor shown in this uh, uh, etching by Doré. There are these great paintings of uh, uh, Victorian might and industrial production in this um, uh, celebrated painting of a, a train station uh, at the time of the height of Queen Victoria. And all of this comes down ultimately to a building that was actually seen by my grandmother who described it to me. And this is the renowned Crystal Palace, which was first constructed in 1851 under um, King, uh, Prince Albert, who was, of course, expired not long afterwards. This is a bustling world in which we now are enmeshed. This is the bustling world that we, we understand for ourselves. And it's no less true of England, but it also applies to other nations of about the same time. If we turn to Article 1333 of the Napoleonic Code, and there you see, I believe, Napoleon on his charger at the Battle of Marengo, probably leaving his troops to die because he was probably less heroic than he let on. And in that document from 1804, there is explicit mention of the importance of tallies and of how they have to be dealt with in matters of law. Is it a surprise, however, that such tallies would have continued to thrive up until a period of about 200 years ago and in more rural settings until 100 years ago? Well, I think the, the emphatic response has to be there is no such surprise because we know naturally of the existence of elaborate mathematical, arithmetical notations, tallies indeed, that were knotted into ropes and that formed the principal means of writing, if you will, or graphic notation among the Inca, who were, uh, of course, obliterated by the Spaniards in the 16th century. These images before you show Inca Kipucamayo, who are the memory keepers employing these knots, beginning to record tallies of tribute. In the um, left-hand side of this image is a document from Woman Poma. It's now in Copenhagen, but it was reported, it was re compiled by a, a very well-educated person of Inca descent. And you can see here someone, sur two figures surrounded by storage chambers, and the kipu, or memory expert, in front of it is using his kipu in order to tally the tribute of state. And then to the lower side gives you an idea of how these might be organized. In other words, these graphic notation systems are not only known among the Inca, but are certainly there centrally in the economic activities of early modern Europe. Yet, this understanding of how these <coughs> might have played a central role in these societies runs counter to the grand narratives of human natation that are found in virtually every book I've ever seen about the nature of writing. This is one of the better books by Albertine Gar. It accompanied an exhibit at the British Museum. And you can see at the very beginning, origin and development of writing. They have on page 18, which indicates that it's the beginning of much more important later sequences involving phonic writing, is the idea of the notion of idea transmission. And in that, Gower reported on the kipu and indeed on the tallies, all lumped together as stages that would eventually be displaced. This has formed eventually now a dominant view of the evolution of notation across the history of humanity. We know, for instance, that in Upper Paleolithic Europe, and these are two not so fanciful depictions of what gentlemen of that period might have looked like, including someone who's fashioning a very important object called the, um, from uh, what is now Czechoslovakia, there were a series of objects. And one of them was found in Blanchard, France, we know it is exceptionally ancient from stratigraphic and chronological controls. It dates to approximately 32,000 years before the present. And in this overlay, you can make out a small series of looping notations and incisions and jabs and jottings on this bone, which have been studied intensively by people, among them Alexander Marshak, who passed away relatively recently. Marshak was an extraordinary man. He was a journalist, but at a in middle age, decided to become quite interested in notations and mathematical systems around the world. And eventually, he secured a research appointment 
as a, an associate at the Peabody Museum at Harvard, where I also happened to have an association. And he began to address seriously what had only been taken as decorative notations on these very, very early objects. And he came to the conclusion, as in this object back here, that it, that in particular represented the, an actual current tally of lunations that would have been experienced by the person employing this object over 32,000 years ago. They correspond to units of 29 and 30, which as we all know, correspond closely to the elements of lunation. Marshak went on from that early work and in 1972 published a seminal book in which he and others began to look at other such objects, including this. This is from an area that is now embroiled in civil war of a very ugly sort. It's on the Congolese and Uganda border. It is a bone that from its context probably dates to approximately 20,000 years before the present. It's called the Shango bone and on it we see probably mathematical notations and understandings which were not thought to have developed until the relatively recent past. And so Marshak owes, and we owe him, a great deal of credit for having plumbed uh, these early notations of humanity. Before he died in one of his last lectures, he focused again on another such object and in a masterly study from, uh, on a piece from the Grotte du Tai in, in southwestern France, which dates to a little bit later, at 12,000 BP, he noticed once again this series of sequential notations that tells us that humans of that period had achieved a kind of cognitive fluency and accomplishment which had not been credited to them before. The problem, of course, with Marshak's um, uh, discussions is that there are no independent proofs. We can simply look at these numerical tallies and think, perhaps, that they would have these associations. Probably he was correct, but he might not have been either. Now, as part of this grand narrative of how humans have gradually begun to accomplish a more sophisticated graphic notation, we have to take these tallies not only to the small communities of an agricultural sort visited by Henry Balfour, but also to far Siberia, where we know that Yakut shaman would use these small bones, you can see in, basically in schematic form, one down below. Here they would record also lunations and other aspects of nature which were an integral part of shamanic understanding and, and centrally important also to their notion of what it was to be Yakut. This is part and parcel of another idea that is, I think, uh, deeply rooted in early anthropology, which is that if we look at ethnographic groups around the world, particularly those who had not yet been changed by globalization, we can perceive them to be living fossils in a way. They represent prior times of many millennia past and can tell us something about that period. I think to some extent this is true, but we also now understand fully that these are people embedded in our own lives as well, and they are, are not people without history. Now, I have to do a little bit of a personal aside. Uh, of course, I spent many years here at, at BYU, and uh, we, we, we very much enjoyed and loved it. But my, my journey and my interest in these notations uh, goes quite a bit further back in the past, and I've described often my scholarly predisposition as being tantamount to a, a, an obsessive compulsive disorder. And here you can see it beginning to develop when I'm eight years old uh, with a runic stone, which I'm massaging fondly. And later I go on to other sorts of eccentric behaviors, looking at Maya sites. My daughter has been enlisted too in this enterprise, and you can see here in the back of my, my um, uh, on a little trip through, through Tikal. And I continued this work, of course, here at BYU, which I, I found a uniquely productive place. And I think many of the ideas and the work that was uh, honored or acknowledged by the MacArthur were, were certainly ones that were developed here. It took me to BYU, a very familiar site to you. And eventually, of course, I've gone on to uh, Brown. And throughout this period, I cannot and have not been able to let go with this, of this fascination with past thought and of whether it is retrievable in some way. I don't know if I've been successful or not, but I wish tonight, in this afternoon rather, to give you two different strands of thinking, different kinds of propositions, uh, which will eventually come to a conclusion at the end of this talk. The argument basically today, after having described this strange journey through London and mid of the Victorian period to the Ashango Bone and what is now war-torn, strife-ridden part of Mexico, I think it's important to understand that this boils down to me, to the idea that there are other graphic notations that are worthy of our attention 
beyond writing. And that these are not simply a stage of cultural change or evolution, but that they continue to be an enduring part of what it means to be a human being. In fact, I think they're probably rather more important than any form of writing. Before developing this argument by looking at two test cases, I wanted to lay before you a series of propositions, which I think are important in describing where I'm going with this. The first proposition simply is that these notations begin to come together and they exist. This is true of writing. This is true of oracle bones. This is true of the shango bone. It is true of the grotta tai bone. It is because they are useful. Humans have found them in precise sociological conditions to be important to their existence. And that is why they are preserved. That is why they are developed. The other proposition that I wish to lay out before you today is that writing, which I have defined, as have many other scholars, as graphically encoded language, it has a very close relationship to language, can coexist with these other graphic notations, as we have seen among the Victorians. And not only that, each one of those graphic notations has a distinct history that is not that of writing. This is an example of what is called early Laban notation, which shows a minuet or a dance from 18th century France uh, with a, uh, a, an interesting title up above. The other proposition, the third one, that I feel is important in laying out this debate or this discussion is that there are many ways of creating these notations. Some of them are capricious. They're matters of whimsy of someone doing it in an ad hoc fashion. But more often, they correspond to systems. And those systems, by definition, are ones that have rules by which they are used and rules by which they are accessed, by which they are decoded to be uh, made into productive sources of information. And beyond that, they are always about people. people who use them, people who teach others how to use them, and eventually that cycle continues for generations upon generations. All forms of graphic notation rely on people. They don't exist by themselves. This takes us, therefore, into the realm of the human mind, into the cognition that has fascinated me over the decades. We have to understand that all graphic notations, be they writing or be they these kinds of um, hack, hack marks or slashes on bones, have first to be encoded, as shown here by a plume on a page of paper. Eventually, there have to be found means to store those notations. This can be done formally in something such as this wonderful library. It can be done in the form of a small private library. But eventually, there must be an act of retrieval by which those memories and those, that sets, the sets of information recorded on the page can be brought into current awareness, as shown here by this lovely image from Fragonard showing a young lady reading in the 18th century. Because of this, all graphic notation has to involve memory. It has to involve the cerebrum, the human mind, the way that it is, uh, conducts itself chemically, neurologically. This is something that is necessarily involves different kinds of storage. The way I see these notations, the way I see writing, the way I see many of the pieces of notation that we've looked at so far, is to compare it in terms of two different kinds of storage. One is simply external storage. And I've been able to find the largest hard disk ever, ever created. In fact, it probably dates to about 1969. And uh, fortunately today, we don't have to use our computers in a, a full body suit, but it seems to have been necessary at that time. That is one set of the continuum, which storage is simply there in a hard drive or something comparable to it, such as a kipu or other forms of notation. If we go to the other extreme, there's complete internal storage. This is the memory that is simply stored and accessed and resurged and renovated within the brains. And clearly, these forms of storage interrelate in very complex ways. Above all, we have to ask, how do those marks relate to meaning? And for this, I will show you once again a kipu. This is one of those knotted documents, which we know were created by the Inca. And some of them are brightly colored, some not. They have many different little weavings on them and knots, which in themselves contain information that is, is only now being decoded. We know that some of these kinds of graphic notations are almost completely arbitrary. If you looked at one of those knots, 
you would not be able to determine whether it refers, let's say, to a unit of alpaca wool or to a certain tributary uh, obligation that is being asked by the Inca state. However, there are other kinds of graphic notations which are far more iconic. They're, they're far more uh, uh, existing in relationship to language. And I'm just going to show you one example that I know very well, which would be, of all things, Swedish noble coat of arms. And we have down below the three crowns of Sweden for Norway, Denmark, and Sweden itself. We have two coats of arms to the side which relate directly to language. Up above is that of a noble family, natto dog, meaning night and day, shown iconically by means of two different colors on the coat of arms. And down below is yet another one which corresponds precisely to the name of that, um, roy that noble family among the Swedes. So we've spoken about memory. We've spoken of how it's stored. We've spoken of how those notations can be completely arbitrary in the relation of the world around us, or they can be ones that have a relationship very close to language and to meaning. I would further insist on two other conditions. The first is you have to have people involved. And I was led to this very almost banal understanding by my friend Dennis Tedlock some years ago when he said, no writing exists by itself. It has to have a human mind to make it, to store it, and to retrieve it. And I think we always have to associate, insist on that presence of human minds and the fact that they exist within societies, which brings us to anthropology. And then again, perhaps it seems like a banal or commonplace observation, but there has to be in graphic notation a material involved. And as in the case of this very famous stone from Sweden, it's showing a runic script from oh, about 800 years after the time of Christ. And in looking at this, I was reminded of an important observation about the graphic arts made by a celebrated um, esthetician from the 19th century, in which he said, in the graphic arts, arts, you cannot get rid of matter. It is always there, as is the human brain. I've provided, I hope, a little bit of introduction. And now I'm going to break out, so to speak, into two little focus groups. The first one is going to examine what I will call a conversation piece having to do with um, one aspect of writing. Each one of these is an alternative stream of graphic notation. I'm not going to be looking at Kipu. I certainly won't be looking at my writing, at least in any way we understand it. But I will begin by looking at one topic. Writing that is not writing. I'll explain what that means in a second or so. The second stream of this talk is going to address non-sequential symbols of people and of groups. And again, this may sound rather abstract, but I hope to flesh out somewhat what these might mean in a second or so. We'll begin with that first set of evidence, writing that is not writing. And for this, I will draw in a little bit of my beloved Maya evidence by looking at what we call pseudoglyphs. Now, they appear to be glyphs or Maya writing, as you can see in this rim band from a text, because they have that small, globular, rounded appearance. Some are larger, some are smaller. They are simulacra. They're, they're attempting to replicate the shape of a Maya glyph. In addition to that, uh, we can see below a peculiar pot in which there's a fully legible text, which I can read here, and it basically refers to the fashioning of important fetishes in the royal court. And up above are pseudoglyphs. In other words, in the same document, so to speak, painted on this pot from about 1,200 to 1,300 years ago, are examples of writing that are legible to us today and writing that is not writing, the so-called pseudoglyphs. How to approach this conceptually? I think one way of looking at it is to draw in a tradition from Western history. And this is the idea of the trompe l'oeil. And I've shown you two of my favorite examples here. The first is Ghost Clock by Wendell Castle. And it looks apparently to be a Chippendale or early American clock with this sash or white cloth over it. That entire piece is carved out of mahogany. And what you see under it is, is nothing but more wood. It is an attempt to trick the eye. It is an attempt to, to, to create a, a setting of guile for the viewer. This is nothing new. Wendell Castle is not the first to employ this kind of technique. If we turn back to the Imhoff prayer book, a very famous example of trompe l'oeil from the early Renaissance, you can see here the pages of this beautiful uh, Psalter. And on it is a hairy fly, which you might attempt to swat off as you turn the pages. But of course, it's painted there. It's tricked the eye. Now, this use of trompe l'oeil and glyphs, and pseudoglyphs in particular, I believe is, is very much uh, at play among 
the Maya in terms of their graphic notations. This is a pot, for instance, of the classic period, also it's about 1,200 years old. You can see two repetitious glyphs, which are somewhat legible, but as a text, they are meaningless, and so I will call them pseudoglyphs. The bottom of this pot has a distinctive chevron design, and that is, very clearly, the design that you would expect to see on the back of an armadillo, which is shown by the Maya to the side. Probably this is no coincidence, because the Maya would have made pots to simulate the look of small armadillo containers, of which a real one is down below, and then to the other side is a Maya pot attempting to look like an armadillo container. The point here is that the pseudoglyphs are meant to track, trick the eye. They're, they're probably there, not so much for decorative reasons, but because at this time, script is highly, highly prestigious. Many people covet script. They wish to use it. But the fact of the matter is that for sociological reasons, it, literacy is highly restricted, highly limited. These together conspire to create pseudoglyphs. Other kinds of writing that is not writing would include my favorite here, uh, hand grenade. Um, I think it's going to lead to profound confusions, possibly to fatalities. Uh, and then my, one of my favorite magazine titles, Selfish Magazine, up, below, up above. English.com has many, many examples of these. Again, the element of sociology has begun to play a role. These are prestigious scripts. It doesn't matter what they say, as long as they're there. The Egyptians were also at this game, particularly those in Roman Egypt. This is another example of writing that is not writing. This is a curse tablet of magical import. It has a variety of peculiar, what we call angelic characters. It has repeated words. These are called by specialists the Wolkes Mystici. They are magical words that are never meant to be read or can only be accessed by magical means of enchantment. And they are an important part of some of the uh, written developments at the time of Christ. As we go into the modern era, there are other words that are not words, writing that is not writing. One of my favorite examples has to be this early serialistic painting by René Magritte, in which you have a variety of objects with designations below in French that don't apply except to one object, which is correctly labeled as a sponge. Words that are not words begin to impact our own modern art. Before he departed on his uh, messy images, Jackson Pollock created this painting which shows a stenographic figure as he labeled it. This is in, from 1942, in which their writing is embellished over the page. The very point is that it is not to be understood. The idea is that the reader is not supposed to gather the intent of that text. This is no less true of some early paintings by Ed Ruchka, in which he's when asked, why did you put those words on these paintings? He simply replied, well, they just occur to me. Finally, there is my favorite example of all of words that are not words, and it is the Zhu Bing Book from the Sky, which I had the privilege of seeing in Washington when it was on display. As part of his um, aesthetic labors before he fled China, he continues to operate in this country, to labor in this country, he devised elaborate Chinese characters, many, many of them. He created a large book, in fact, that was created from woodcuts taken from the script, and not a single one of those signs is, in fact, intelligible. This itself was a prodigious labor to both in, become an, involved with this writing system and then to create writing that is not writing. Finally, as a final part of the stream, I wanted to address non-sequential symbols of people and groups. And here we can look at heraldry. We can look at, for instance, the first known coat of arms from um, an early Plantagenet. These are obviously martial. They are very much concerned with lineage and with class, and as to the rights as to who would use those heraldic emblems over time. They are symbolic of a person embedded within a lineage. They imply succession. They imply people that will come afterwards, also of high, high origin. Fascinating thing about heraldry is that they are graphic notations, but they stand also for groups or people. They sometimes even have conjectural elements. These are supposed shields with heraldic emblems that come from the Roman period. And then my favorite of all, the supposed heraldry of uh, Christ the Savior, as shown here with the lamb, and then you can see that the veil of Veronica, of course, has become his shield. These are conjectural. 
but probably the most extreme example of all of heraldry, which is corresponding to the position of a person in society and is a graphic notation, are the infamous Grenville quarterings from about 1830. This is the tail end of this period. Each one of those small coats of arms reflects the August lineage of a particular member of a noble family in England. Now these notations that stand for people probably take us back into the origins of civilization. They take us back, in fact, to the notations that you would see on pottery, as in these very early examples of marks that were found on Neolithic pots in China, dating to approximately 4600 BC. We don't know, of course, what these things indicate, but we do suspect they would correspond perhaps to potters. Perhaps they would correspond to social groups who might have made these pots. We know that this form of writing that is not writing, that is corresponding with notations that are somehow reflecting social groups, occur throughout Chinese script. They incorporate into the script. They're often known as clan marks because they appear to correspond to families. They're found in the third millennium, the second millennium, the first millennium BC. They are an important part of what it means to make notations in Chinese civilization. As we turn to another part of the world, we also know of pottery marks that are found on some of the earliest pottery from dynastic Egypt or at the very beginnings of the civilization. Again, we don't know exactly what they mean, but surely this is meaningful notation that we suspect corresponds somehow to tributary obligations, to the groups making the pottery, to those who are receiving the contents of these pots. And then if we bring ourselves to something that is a little more familiar, which would be mason's marks. Now, we know of medieval mason's marks, which I'll refer to in a minute, but mason's marks, which again, probably have a social meaning, although very difficult to decode, are found as early as the Minoan palaces, which are, uh, of course, associated with the myths of, of uh, the ancient Greek past. These marked bricks, these marked stones, are found also in other parts of the world, including what are probably the imperial complex state settings associated with the civilization that we call the moche. And this is from a very different part of the world. It's from South America. But in excavating some of the fantastically large buildings left by the moche civilization, many archaeologists have found within it marked bricks. There is no writing at this time as we would conventionally understand it. But there is a graphic notation system that may correspond to social groups. Ultimately, it takes us into the medieval masons' marks of um, to the designs used by Freemasons and others that bedeck and embellish many medieval buildings around Europe. Here you can see I've highlighted for you one such Mason's mark. We suspect that these were local systems made and employed by the Masons. They probably indicated uh, how many pieces of stone would be produced by a certain atelier for eventual payment and would be incorporated into these structures. This is probably my most famous, uh, the most famous and my, my favorite example of Mason's marks, which are all over the Rosalind Chapel in Scotland, and which have been featured in the Da Vinci Code, among other things. I suspect, however, most of these are not so much mystical as they are telling us about the makers and the social groups behind these architectural marvels. Now, this idea of objects that refer to social groups is brought together, I think, to a glorious conclusion by this extraordinary find, which was made by Frank Solomon of the University of Wisconsin at Madison a few years ago, he discovered that complex kipu still exist in some highland Andean communities. But this is what's fascinating about them. The capacity to create these kipu has now been lost. And they've become instead objects that simply correspond to corporate groups within that society, ones that Indian ethnographers and locals call ailu. You can see that they actually drape them on their heads like uh, octopus toys, or they might place them in front of social groups. Every year, the Ailu or corporate group takes out its patrimonial kipu, inherited probably from 70, 80 years ago, and lays it out. There is no current knowledge of how these are created, but we do know at least that today, within that society, they function as corporate markers. They stand for social groups. However, this brings me to the final rather pessimistic point that I have to make. And it is that Kipu and many of these other documents, the ultimate meaning behind the pottery marks of these that probably indicate social groups are unread and probably unreadable. There's one form of social marking that is regrettably known to many of us, 
And these would be gang tags. We found, I imagine, in parts of Salt Lake City, Provo, certainly other parts of the country. Each one of these has within it elements of writing. But what they actually represent are assertive, aggressive markers of territory, which have real complications for those who can understand them, who belong to other groups, and who trespass on these territories. Some of these refer, for instance, to crip killers up above, or to certain uh, uh, numbers of the California Penal Code having to do with, uh, with homicide. These correspond to social groups, albeit in a very sinister way. So ultimately, the second strand that I've been speaking about is one that involves graphs that relate to a person or to a social entity. They're often very arbitrary, although not in the case of the gang tidings, uh, tags, but also not many people understand them. There's a relatively small group involved in interpreting them, and that also means that there are limits to how many of these graphs can be understood by any one person at one time. These are inherently rather limited systems. What all of this means is it conspires to make many of these tags, as important as they are, to the understanding of ancient societies, an interpretive dilemma, and I would even say a nightmare, because all of those arbitrary associations that would enlighten us to, as to the meaning are gone, they're fugitive. And they probably never were intended to be broadly understood. So as I come to the conclusion here, I'm just going to lay out a series of arrows. The white one responds, corresponds to what we call writing. It's the writing that I employ daily on my computer. But there are concurrent other systems of graphic notation which come in at different times. They disappear at different times. They have a very variable relations to writing itself. Some might be there before writing even comes into existence. And what we are fascinated by often are the connections and overlap between these systems of graphic notation that play such an important role for us. Now necessarily as we come to the end of this talk about memory and graphic notation, I think we have to address the question of what awaits us if we know writings as a system of phonic transcription is coming in late, what might happen in the future? And I have, of course, to show you startling stories and the uh, uh, electronic home library of the future. Here you can see it highlighted. Uh, I'm happy to say my home looks nothing like this. Um, in order to suggest that it could be a, that in the future, graphic notations will begin to develop in ways we don't fully anticipate. It may be that future graphic notations will incorporate writing or aspects of it, but rather they would be rather like hybrids, almost, if you will, at the margins of writing. We see these when we, of course, fly around, as in these emergency exit signs, which are legible to all of us, and the icons that are in the upper right-hand corner of this diagram that tell us about what is handicap accessible, where baby strollers can go. And then my favorite of all, there's a comic strip called Icon Man. And you can see here that he's waking to the sound of his alarm. It could be also that writing will become aestheticized, as we see in this gorgeous example of polychromed polygraphy that incorporates writing, but also slashes of other elements in a pure color that are joyous to behold. Now, I began this talk with reflections about an unexpected intrusion of non-writing into the apparatus of a modern nation state, and one that was on the cusp of the Industrial Revolution that we are living and experiencing right now. But I also think it's important to say that there's no innate predisposition to writing. We don't inherit this. What we do inherit is this ability to make meaningful marks. And I suspect that this is something that will continue always to be a part of our existence, whether by an artist here or by a child down below. And eventually, I hope, and as I hope some of you will do in your future research, is to reflect on and extend and gloriously redefine what it means to talk about notation and memory at the margins of writing. Thank you. I'm more than willing to entertain any questions, if you have any. Yeah, uh, David. Uh -huh. They certainly play a role, and in fact, there's so many forms of notation like this that would be um, that that are relevant to this, that that relate to ideas that exist uh, alongside writing. Absolutely, but yeah, there there are many many such notations, David. Are there any other questions?
Yes, karma. Mm-hmm. No, I, I haven't made a study of. Can we repeat I will the repeat the question. Car, uh, Karma has asked: uh, Is are there studies that look at the beginnings of writing and what how it might relate uh, cognitively to human development? I haven't done a study of such things, but they're they're obviously relevant to looking at the second issue, which which I wasn't addressing here, but that is the innate disposition of humans to to making marks, and I, I think it would be absolutely relevant and, and a very interesting paper. Well, I are there any more questions? Yes, Don. Don. Do you see these uh, systems as independent of one another, uh, or is writing a kind of subset of notational systems that can come to draw these distinctions? Yeah, it's a subset, uh, and they are largely independent of one another. In other words, um, uh, and, and sometimes they, they will merge with writing and then detach. I, I think, for instance, in our study of numbers, it's clear that numbers are, are not really in some ways a form of writing. It's a separate kind of notation that often gets packaged with writing. And it has, some people will, will of course, read it as, as language, but they're, they have different histories. They come in at different times. Uh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, they, they, they certainly involve acts of memory, and, but, but my point would be they're not connected with what we would call conventionally oral societies, ones that would be so, solely concerned with oral transmission. And th that, that's what I think is, uh, I was trying to be subversive about. Uh, uh, John, or John, please, yeah, John. Speaking of numbers, that made me think of scientific notation. Mm -hmm. It, it would be it would be another one of those arrows you might say it might it would be another system of notation that would be sometimes coupled with or associated with writing that would help to explain what's going on and we also know that they're coming in at a later date John they're not there necessarily at the origins of script itself and so yes it would it would very much belong to this category of a separate notation system the way I look on these is almost like coaxial cables we we call it writing but in fact it has all of these different strands in it that have different origins and they are sometimes combined together, sometimes they're split apart, but they do have individual histories. But yes, they, they do certainly would belong to that category. Could science, would you say that there's a hierarchy there that you could not have scientific notation without writing? You have writing made without scientific notation? I, I would say yes. You could have those forms of notation without writing. Barbara, were you going to? Mm -hmm. That's right, um, but short of telepathy, it would it would eventually have to appear as a form of focused electrons or some kind of electron transmission on a, a screen. So it would have to be material in some way to be accessed. Uh, Anyone else other than Don? I'm, I'm happy for your persistent questions. I'm delighted for them. But Don, go ahead. Why not? I would see those as bodily practices, and such as, for instance, when you read someone yawning, 
uh, or you look at someone flickering their eyes or staring at you, th they're communicating meaning. But I would say they're not graphic in the same way of being a record that stays put, at least for a time. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the, the tally stick you started with um, in, in England. Um, it seemed like there was a, they cut across educational boundaries to some extent. Mm -hmm. is, is there any kind of unique relationship there of why it was developed with regards to education? Um, it's a good, it's, it's an excellent point. What, what is fascinating though is that many of them have these chancery hands on them and they were clearly employed by the royal court, which presumably did not want for literacy. And so I see them as, again, a, a separate system of notation. And sometimes they'll flesh it out by writing on it, but, but they're, they seem to be somewhat independent of it. And they're expiring, as we know, about 100 years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think all of these are relatively permanent. Obviously, a, a clay brick uh, that's unfired is not going to last very long. But it, it, the, the, po the important question to ask is, how long does it need to last for someone to read it? And in some cases, if you're giving a bunch of bricks to construct a pyramid, it probably needs to last about a week or two. But in the case of other objects which flow through all sorts of complex social networks, it's going to need to last longer. Uh, there and back. Uh huh. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, we breathlessly await what's going to happen in 100 years. I, I suspect the way we look at writing is not going to be quite the same as it is today. And even if you look at book publishing, uh, books that are meant to be accessible to younger people or even to teenagers, they tend to sprinkle a lot of images in them in ways that might not have been so common 100 years ago. So that, that relationship does seem to be shifting. Um, Zach, I think. Yeah, Zach. Uh -huh. Um, probably not, in the sense of some subversive comment on highfalutin elite practices. Is that, is that what you're getting at? Um, no, no. I, I think it's simply something that, that dolls up the piece and makes it look a little more alluring and attractive in that particular case. Yeah. Uh, you, you, yes, please. Yeah, huh? Right, uh, right. But, but the mm -hmm. original sort of like chemistry of the seems to change. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm trying to, to formulate a question, but does this fit in with, with, with what you're saying in terms of your study? I mean, for example, with, with also the, uh, um, the pseudo books, how to a, a literate person they, they mean nothing, but to those un, un illiterate persons, mm -hmm. they might seem like, you know, this, for example, speech that might be attributed. The, the point here would be that there, there always has to be a community of users. And, and by users, I mean people that make the marks, but also those who can understand them. And the fact of the matter is that sometimes those groups, in fact, I think for many of the objects we're looking at, those groups are probably very small. In, this, in the circle of masons employing certain marks, it might be no more than an area of about 10 to 15 miles. And you might go to another cathedral where other masons' marks would be employed, and some of them would look very similar to the Mason's marks being used in another county nearby. But the fact of the matter is they have different meanings, different associations. Uh, yeah, Klein, please. 
I think that that's very, very astute, Clay, and I, I think that's exactly on the mark, that these systems, many of them are probably coming to, into existence for what we would call economic reasons, have to do with goods moving around, accounting for who owes, owes what, uh, for what objects are being uh, transmitted. And, uh, yeah. The heraldry means something else. Yeah, yeah. Of class, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. And and you would often, even today, if you want a coat of arms, you have to purchase it from the the, the College of Arms in England. It has to, it's a it's an economic transaction. Um, well, uh, John Sorensen, please. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, the, right, John. Those are other semiotic codes, but I, I would probably place them apart because they don't have this kind of enduring quality. Yeah. Uh, perhaps one more question, John, or? Um, Certainly. Yeah. There was a couple of, um, there we go, in the chat, I think. Uh, the gentleman who's standing up, who, who will certainly be attended to. Oh, Jack, yes. Okay, Jack, hi. Uh, a question, I'm interested in the uh, magical curse tablets. Mm. Well, the, there, there's a, a classic book on the subject of curse tablets, which I consulted for with that particular image, and um, uh, some of them just seem to be re repeated syllables in a kind of nonsensical fashion. And I think the understanding among the scholars of that material, and obviously I'm not one, is that uh, they are completely random and arbitrary. 